Okay. So we've come to the so-called classical phase of the civil rights movement. And we'll talk about what does that mean, the classical phase. But it will include some events with which I'm sure you are at least passingly familiar, if not very familiar. Though I may have a somewhat different take on some of them, or I may emphasize different things, we'll see. We'll, of course, talk about the Selma to Montgomery March. You know who that man is on the right? He just died recently. It's John Lewis. And we will talk about the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church there in my hometown of Birmingham. But first, a little bit of context and to kind of pick up where we left off last time, talking about World War II. Warren Winch, as you'll recall, and perhaps already knew that black veterans had been instrumental in fighting that fight against fascism defeating Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. A lot of those people refused to come back to America as second-class citizens, having fought for and risked death for their country. Now, some white people may have been convinced that this was rightly so, but some became even more insecure at the prospect of uh, black men returning and asserting their rights as equal citizens. And some black veterans found that out in the most brutal of ways, including pictured there at top right, Sergeant Isaac Woodard, a decorated veteran who had served in the Pacific in the war against Japan as a longshoreman earning a battle commendation for offloading supplies under fire. He had been discharged from the Army at Fort Gordon outside Augusta, Georgia, after the war, and decided to take a Greyhound bus home to North Carolina. And that bus stopped in South Carolina, and Woodard had asked the bus driver, you know, did he have time to get off the bus there when it stopped and go and use the restroom or something, get something out of the store? I don't remember exactly what, but point being is, you know, just give me just a minute. I mean, any a common request that any passenger on any bus or anything might make. And the white bus driver didn't like it, didn't like the assertiveness of Woodard as a black man, probably insecure at the fact that Woodard was a veteran and this man was not. And he decided to tell the police in the next town that this black guy had been harassing him on the bus. Yeah. And so the sheriff in the town next town, the bus stopped him, along with several of his deputies, decided to beat Woodard to teach him a lesson, including him beating him in about the eyes with their batons. And they blinded him. ruined both of his eyeballs in this brutal beating that nearly took his life. And um, the news of this reaches Walter White, the NAACP, who was so appalled by it that he took it directly to the president at the time. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had died in office in his fourth consecutive term as president and Truman from Missouri becomes president upon his death. Uh, Truman is an interesting figure. He does some things to advance or to sort of put civil rights at least on the table. And remember, he's a Democrat like Roosevelt, and so this would be something that would fly in the face of the interest of many, of most of the white people in his party from the South at the time. Uh, that being said, you know, he's also a pragmatic politician and he understood that this would 
court. The black vote at a time where after World War II in some places around the country there was increasing black voting. So Truman has, a, you might say, a mixed record. In any case, uh, White bringing to his attention this incident is perhaps instrumental in his decisions to one, create a commission on civil rights, a United States Commission on Civil Rights to advise the Office of the President on matters of civil rights, which doesn't seem like very much, and it's not, but it is something. Some action by the executive to recognize the value of civil rights as an issue and he issues an executive order finally desegregating the armed forces of the United States. This, uh, uh, Isaac Woodard, I should have had his name on there. There's a new book about that incident and its impact on President Truman. I can't remember the, the name of the title, but a recent historical monograph on that. Now, this is at a time that America is, is slipping into a cold war with the Soviet Union, Russia at the time as it was ruled by the Communist Party. The U.S. and the Soviet Union, you'll recall, had been allies in World War II because they had a common enemy in Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany does not exist anymore. And the United States and the Soviet Union are very, very different. Soviet Union is committed to the growth globally of revolutionary socialism, which flies in the face of uh, capitalist notions of individual property ownership and the embrace of a stratified society in which some people could be very rich and others very poor. You know, revolutionary socialists envision a classless society. Also, even though it very clearly has some issues with the realities of this, the United States is theoretically a liberal democratic republic, whereas the Soviet Union is a one-party dictatorship. And those two, though, emerged out of World War II as the two superpowers of the world. And they never do go to war directly with one another. It's why they call it a Cold War. The primary reason being is that by the 1950s, both sides had thermonuclear weapons that if they unleash them on one another, could not only destroy one another, but perhaps release enough radiation to literally destroy all life on Earth. And so they end up fighting in what they call proxy wars in places like Korea and Vietnam, where one side supplies one group, the other side supplies or maybe trains or funds the other. Occasionally, one side or the other sends troops to fight in one of these wars, but never both. The importance for understanding the civil rights movement in this classical phase of this Cold War context is kind of twofold. One, because the movement is going to be talking about equality, and at times will we'll begin to focus on economic equality, it makes it a target for people to say, well, that's just a socialist movement, and they're revolutionary socialists. They're a bunch of communists. Look at that image. Look at that billboard. Martin Luther King at communist training school. Of course, it wasn't anything to do with communism. King associated with a couple of people who had backgrounds with, like, the Communist Party USA, but all that is is a nonviolent uh, civil disobedience uh, institute. I mean, all these doing here is learning about the tactics of nonviolent protests, anything to do with communism. But you could label civil rights protesters this and make them look like enemies in this Cold War sense. Bunch of crazy communists. They've done this with the labor movement already in America. But the other thing is, where you could sort of use the Cold War to your advantage, is to say, okay, what if we sort of set aside these notions of economic equality and focus on some, some new issues. 
What if we focus strictly on Jim Crow, that is segregation by law, de jure segregation as an issue, and disenfranchisement, that is the inability of black people to register and vote? What if we focus on those two things and say, America isn't really a true democracy. We don't really have freedom here in America because you have Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement. If we do that, we make America look like a hypocrite on the world stage. The Cold War is a great battle for the hearts and minds of people all throughout the world. You have America and the Soviet Union trying to convince people in Africa and Asia and Latin America whose way of life is better, capitalism or communism. And if you're the United States and you're saying, we don't, you know, that's a dictatorship. They don't have freedoms in the Soviet Union. They don't have freedom of the press and speech and religion. They don't have elections and that kind of thing. And yet here you have a group of people showing that uh, you don't really have that in America because Jim Crow and disenfranchisement. You look like a fool. You look like a liar and a hypocrite. And the Soviet Union is going to use that to their advantage. They're going to, they have a couple of state-run newspapers in the Soviet Union. They don't have a free press, of course, but they did have two state-run newspapers, and they like to, this is a parody of the Statue of Liberty making America look like a monster and a liar with black people in chains. They say, look what a liar the United States is. There's not actually freedom there. Look what they do to black people in America. And it would be an embarrassment for the United States, and it might cause the American government to want to address these issues. Does that make sense? And it eventually would. The, the, the administration of John F. Kennedy would realize they were being humiliated internationally and that America needed to do something to address the issue at hand or the issues that were being uh, focused on by the, the movement. Supported, of course, by the black Christian church, both institutionally, organizationally, and spiritually. And then, of course, by the press. We talked about, we've defined in here civil disobedience, I think, more than once as a way of deliberately breaking laws to showcase their injustice, to raise awareness. Well, you can't raise awareness without the media, the press. And so let's go ahead and define, then, this classical phase. It's a phrase that was coined by someone in the movement at the time to kind of highlight the fact that the Civil Rights Movement didn't just appear out of nowhere after World War II or in 1954 or 55. And it has continuing relevance for us now because it didn't end in 1965. A couple of years ago, I had to really stress this, but with the events of the past year, it is blatantly obvious the Civil Rights Movement continued. So this classical phase is kind of a nod to the way we've used that phrase uh, in, in the past to refer to a period where things are really flourishing, things are really active, and specifically here, the nonviolent movement. The nonviolent movement associated with figures like John Lewis and, of course, Martin Luther King and others was especially active between 1954 and 65 or so. And it's the period in which you eventually, as we'll see when we get to the end of this lecture, have two pretty significant vic legislative victories that we'll look at at the end. Let's look at some of the things that will usher this period in, some, some new beginnings, some, you might say, seminal moments. One of them, and this is hotly debated among historians, legal historians, political scientists, but I and others would argue one of the important seminal moments is the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board. As Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, but also including several other cases from around the South. A ruling in which the court overturns Plessy. You'll recall that in Plessy versus Ferguson, the court sanctioned Jim Crow and established the doctrine of so-called separate but equal. 
the fact that segregation is okay if you have supposedly equal facilities. Well, the court in Brown acknowledged that there never were equal facilities. There definitely never was intended that there would be. That the entire purpose of separation or segregation was white supremacy. And that even setting that aside, the effect of segregation in an unequal society was to have a psychological detrimental effect on black children that led them to believe, as the evidence in the case showed, that white things were better. Famously, there's a doll test that a psychologist performed where children were presented with a black and a white doll and inevitably would ask, which, you know, which one do you want or what's the better one? Pointed at the white one. So the court in Brown rules that segregation specifically in public education in schools, K through 12 schools, was unconstitutional. So you cannot have laws that dictate white kids go to one school, black kids go to another, which throughout the South you did have. Now, the court, having said that, didn't really give any specific guidance as to how you would actually desegregate schools in the South or anywhere else. It, it gave vague phrases like, well, you should do this in good, school boards should show good faith. And this should happen with, quote, all deliberate speed. Well, what the hell does that mean? It would be up to lower courts to decide. And the thinking among Southern people, white people, was, well, this only, this is about like five or six cases. It only applies to those school districts, not our school district. So you would, and that's not true, the court intended it to apply much more broadly. But you would have to file court case upon court case of every single school board all throughout the South would have to be faced with a court case in order to actually do something to address this. So you're looking at years and years of litigation, and it would be up to the lower federal courts. And a lot of those lower federal court judges, they're local white people. A lot of them are segregationists and racist too. So it would be up to higher courts to overturn them. And there would be appeals and more appeals and trials upon trials. This is going to take years to actually have any impact, in other words. And I will tell you, as somebody who works on and writes about these things, for about 10 years, it led to almost zero desegregation of schools. Almost. And it took 10 more years after that for you to see anything resembling what we might call not just desegregation, but actual integration. Now, that being said, the NAACP does seize upon this and initiate something they call Operation Implementation, whereby local NAACP branches would petition their local school boards and say, hey, the courts made this decision. What do you plan to do? What is your plan to desegregate your schools? And when inevitably the white school boards would either ignore these, dismiss them, say we don't plan to do anything, whatever it was, then you could begin the process of filing a lawsuit against that school board. And the NAACP Legal Defense Fund could work with local attorneys to work on that lawsuit and to see it through. But you had to have citizens, black citizens, that were willing to be plaintiffs and to work with you. And this was hard because oftentimes these people live in communities where the, all the banks are owned and run by white people. The land is all owned by white people. The businesses are owned by white people. And white people organize, and I'm not talking about the Ku Klux Klan, although they definitely do that as well, but there's an even more insidious organization known as the White Citizens Council. It pops up all over the South. That's essentially people who are one and the same with the Klan, but who are smarter than people in the Klan and realize that violence and cross burnings and lynchings are actually detrimental to the cause of preserving white supremacy and segregation. And then what you should do is to work more quote unquote legally, which is to say if anybody works with the NAACP, signs a petition or files a lawsuit or whatever it may be, you fire them, evict them from their land, refuse to give them credit, 
refuse to work with them if you're the bank, or whatever it may be. We call this economic reprisal. And so this would tend to cause black people to say, look, I'd love to have change here, and I support what the NAACP is doing, but I can't actually get behind this publicly because I'll be fired, I'll lose my home, I'll lose my job, my business, my credit. And oftentimes, members of the Citizens Council were at the same time members of state legislatures, which go to work immediately after Brown, passing law upon law upon law, making it harder for the NAACP to get anything done. Hello. Come, come right. Ma'am, <laughs> Did she? She pawned you off on the high seat? No, we're about to make this way. You came in here and you're not even going to stay? Yeah. Man. That is hurtful. I recognize from the photo it's actually moving. I w would that you would stay, but if you must go, then go. You can bring us back to Chick-fil-A? No. Okay, that's good. You still haven't. You see what my former students, the way I'm treated? Former student? Yeah. That's what I am to you? Well, so will we see the way I'm treated, I'm just saying. Well, I'm saying you never followed up and you didn't come to lunch with us at the time we said. <sighs> Who's the message? It would be one thing if you interrupt my class and you bring me food. Like this would make. I haven't fun. gone to get the food yet. So maybe I will get something. Is what you're saying? No. Okay, great. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go back to Brown. Then. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Bye. Always, a student always in my heart. Uh, so, legislatures would try to do what they had done in the redemption period and pass laws that, if you just look at them, as we would say in the law, on their face, there's nothing about black, white, you know, white supremacy and uh, secondary citizenship, but the intention is to maintain the status quo. For example, they pass what they call pupil placement laws which allow local school boards to place students in schools based upon a list of factors. And like among the factors would be, um, if it would tend to cause a disturbance in the, the local population, if a placement of a certain student in one school would be upsetting to people or anything, then you could avoid that. We could fall back on that and go, we can't put this black student in this white school because people will get upset and the law says that's something we can consider. And all kinds of things. I mean, there are places where there, the courts order school boards to allow this black student into a white school and they just abolish the school system. Because they know white people have the money to start private schools and black people don't. And so the thing being is that nobody would support desegregating the schools because then black people are not going to have any schools. And if they don't, then fine, because at least white people could organize private ones in, in the absence of the public. And even though some of these laws are, are plainly unconstitutional, it's still every single law that a state legislature passes requires a new court case, and that takes time. And then, of course, there's violence. There were, in Mississippi in 1955, just one state, one year, three murders, three lynchings, two black men trying to vote, one a local NAACP officer, and the third being a young man from Chicago named Emmett Till, who has some sort of interaction with a white woman in a store while he's visiting family in Mississippi that this white woman didn't like but it was the way he looked at her, something he said, something he did, and complained about it to her husband. And they come and drag him out of his bed at his uncle's house in the middle of the night, beat and torture him, and eventually shoot and kill him and throw his body over a bridge into the Tallahatchie River. His grieving mother insists upon an open casket funeral to show the condition of the body of her son and allows uh, Jet Magazine, Jet being one of two post-World War II uh, African-American periodicals that 
many, many black families would subscribe to, the other being Ebony. But Jet Magazine was allowed to run the photos of Emmett Till's body and his grieving mother, and it shocked, obviously, a lot of people throughout the country and abroad. And of course, the white men who did it got away with it scot-free. They were acquitted by all white jury. <clears throat> and there is events in Montgomery the following year, or that same year, I should say, Montgomery being the state capital of Alabama, in the heart of the Black Belt, where black folks make up the majority of the ridership of the local uh, bus line, the city bus company there, operated a system in which black people would sit, or forced to sit in the back of the bus, white people sit in the front, and if the middle gets crowded, the white bus drivers, who were lower class, insecure white men mostly, could turn around and bark at the black people in the middle and say, you get out, make room for this white person. And they treated the black riders like shit, generally speaking, on top of the very idea of the segregated system with the blacks having to sit in the back. And black folks in Montgomery began to organize to try to get, I mean, not even to abolish the segregated system, but just to get better treatment. And to think about ways in which they might force the bus company to change. Among the first to organize were teachers at the local teachers college there, it's now Alabama State University, the HBCU there in Montgomery, who organized as the Black Women's Political Council under the leadership of a woman named Joanne Robinson. And decided that they could coordinate a boycott of the bus line, some, a quintessentially American act. The, the, an act at the heart of what became the American Revolution, boycotting you know, British goods. That you could refuse to ride the bus until you got some guarantee of better treatment. And if black people make up the majority of the riders, you could threaten the integrity of the company. They might you know, begin to go out of business and decide to change. They worked, though, in conjunction with other local leaders, including the leader of the local NAACP, and local preachers, famously so, to sort of um, orchestrate the boycott in conjunction with a singular act of defiance, of civil disobedience. To have one person deliberately defy the law and to have them then uh, be charged criminally, but to also have them file a civil suit against the bus company charging that maybe even the segregated system itself was unconstitutional. All of this would be in conjunction with the boycott. And of course, Rosa Parks ends up beating that individual, but there's a couple things I want to note here. We have this image in our head of Rosa Parks here and there as some sort of random, tired old seamstress in the city who just decided out of nowhere one day she was going to refuse to give up her seat. Which is somewhat true, but is only a fraction of the truth. Rosa Parks was not some random person on a random day. She was an officer in the local NAACP. That's her picture there in the bottom uh, with the leader of the local NAACP, E.D. Nixon. So she is not just a random somebody. Furthermore, that is her there at a training school in Tennessee for nonviolent protests and civil disobedience. She's an officer in the NAACP and has been literally trained in nonviolent civil disobedience. Her act was not random, perhaps the exact moment of it was, but this was planned. And it was going to set off the boycott, and she was going to be a part of this larger fight. And her lawyer that represented her in her criminal case was also the attorney who was going to file a civil lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the segregated bus system in the first place. His name is Fred Gray. He's pictured there in the third of a series of photographs of him with Martin Luther King, who becomes the leader of an organization that calls itself the Montgomery Improvement Association. 
that name rings a bell, no, that's sort of harkening back to Garvey and Garveyism and Unia. But it was intended to be the vehicle for local protest, for nonviolent protest and civil disobedience there in the city that might go beyond just challenging segregation on the buses. King was chosen as the leader because there was a lot of factionalism and infighting among other African-American leaders there in the city, and King was kind of the new guy. He's from Atlanta. His father was a pastor of Ebenezer here in Atlanta. He's got a doctoral degree. He's uh, very charismatic and incredibly intelligent and know, has read a lot and has written a lot and knows a lot about civil disobedience, nonviolent protests, generally speaking, what we call passive resistance. He studied the life and works of Gandhi in India, for example, and practitioners of the so-called social gospel in, in Christianity, like Reinhold Niebuhr, that name is not important, but just throwing it out there. This is what makes King a nationally known figure, being the sort of face of the Montgomery bus boycott, along with the guy who would be his sort of literal right-hand man through all of this in the coming um, 10, 15 years, Ralph Abernathy, who was also a preacher there in Montgomery. So they nearly bankrupted the bus company. They organized carpools to get people to and from work in school. The police harassed them, of course, but it was effective enough where the bus company nearly went out of business, but people don't often know or realize or acknowledge it was the civil suit that was the thing. The, the civil lawsuit that Fred Gray filed that results in a federal court ruling in Browder v. Gale, in which the court Relying upon Brown v. Board applies that principle, not in, in the case of Brown, it was segregated schools, but it applies the same principle more or less to the segregated buses and said it's unconstitutional. So for the first time, you had a federal court expanding upon Brown and applying that principle to some other form of segregation. I skipped over poor Claudette Colvin, and that's actually apropos because we've skipped over her historically. Rosa Parks was not the first woman in anywhere, or much less in Montgomery alone, to give up, to refuse to give up her seat on the bus. Claudette Coleman, a young woman, had done that some months before Rosa Parks and had been arrested. The reason history knows the name, though, of Rosa Parks and not Claudette Coleman is partly because of what I told you, because Rosa Parks. Is she's older, she's an activist, she's trained in nonviolence, she's an officer in the NAACP. Claudette Cohen was more of a young kid. She'd had a child out of wedlock, which is only significant because they knew that her name would be dragged through the mud as part of this, and that she was perhaps not prepared to handle being the sort of face of, of this movement. And Rosa Parks was. But in recent years, historians have said, hey, why don't we recognize you know, some of the people who have engaged in these brave acts you know, before the folks who became famous for it, so to speak. Finally, uh, King, Abernathy, they will get together with other preachers throughout the Deep South and form an organization that would be like the Montgomery Improvement Association, but on a much larger scale, that will be dedicated to initiating protest campaigns, nonviolent protest campaigns against segregation and disenfranchisement throughout the South, maybe even throughout the country. And that is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, of which King becomes the head and later Abernathy, or SCLC. Let's talk about the nine and the four then. One of the places where activists with the support of the NAACP and the Legal Defense Fund press the issue of desegregating schools is in Little Rock, Arkansas. What they wanted was the federal court in Arkansas to approve a plan to force, in essence, the local school board and that the city there 
to establish what they call a freedom of choice plan. This is the way desegregation occurs in its earliest forms. What do we mean by desegregation as opposed to integration? Well, desegregation as under a freedom of choice plan would mean that a few uh, brave and assertive black students who wanted to and whose parents were able to be exposed and you know wouldn't be fired from jobs, maybe they work for like the federal post office or something and, and don't have to worry about being the subject of economic reprisal. But those few students could petition and say, I would like to not have to attend the segregated black high school or whatever, I would like to attend the white high school. And courts would force school boards to approve some of these requests, and then you would have a scenario where you would have not 100% segregated schools, you'd still have all black schools, but you would have some white schools that had a few black students in them. That's desegregation. As opposed to actual integration would mean you wouldn't have black schools and white schools at all, you would just have schools, right? That's a long way down the road. In some places, it never happens. But all of these nine students in Little Rock were asking for was the ability to go to these few white schools, including Central High School there in Little Rock. Federal court uh, orders the school board to consider and, and approve these requests. But rather than allow the students to attend the school, eventually the governor of Arkansas would just shut, shut the whole school system down for years. But there is this moment where they are admitted and they are set to attend and they go to enroll and a, a mob surrounds the school and harasses these students. And you can see vividly depicted there at the top right. And the governor's not going to do anything about it. He's enabling this you know, violent, threatening reaction from local white people who are not allowing these students to attend the school. And it forces the president at the time, uh, the, the man who had been the leader of American and all allied forces, in fact, in World War II, Dwight Eisenhower, who becomes president, he's forced to deploy the military, the United States Army, the airborne, to Little Rock, to protect the integrity of these students and their ability to attend this school. The United States president has to order in the army to allow nine black students to attend a white school in Little Rock. And of course, it's all caught on camera, broadcast throughout America and for all the world to see that in order to attend a white school, nine black kids need the full power of the U.S. Army Airborne. And then, like I said, eventually the governor just closes the damn school system, and there just aren't any public schools in Little Rock for a year or two. Like, there's like bullets going into it? Sorry, so they didn't go to school for a whole year? Correct. They just weren't schools. Yeah. They do it in Virginia, too. It's not school. Oh, you want us to integrate? You force us to? Well, what if we don't have schools? Oh, well. That's the kind of defiance we're talking about. That's what we mean. I didn't, I didn't define this or speak to it directly a moment ago in the last slide. That's what we mean by massive resistance. It's that white people will do very nearly anything to avoid even just desegregating schools. Now, what about other public accommodations? By the end of the 50s, four young men in Greensboro, North Carolina, who had been having conversations with their parents, with their preacher, teachers, about what can we do, you know? What, what, we, we see a, a sort of growing energy among our people to address segregation, inequality, disenfranchisement. What can we do? And they decided what they wanted to do was engage in a sit-in. These young men are students at North Carolina A&T, the HBCU there in, in Greensboro and decided that they would go and sit in at the lunch counter at the local department store, uh, the Woolworths. And back then they didn't have shopping malls and every downtown of every city would have a few department stores. Like a Crest was one of them and other of course Woolworths. Where black people were welcome to come in and spend their money on goods, but the little lunch or snack counters off to the side that offered sandwiches or coffee or, or pastries or whatever, uh, those counters were whites only. 
And these young men went and sat down. Now, like we said with Rosa Parks, they are not the first individuals who ever engaged in such an act. Why it is significant is because when they are kicked out, they resolve to come back again the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And eventually, crowds gather, both of people in support of the young men and also in opposition who are harassing them, yelling at them, eventually doing violence to them. And the third component, in addition to supportive people and angry white people, would be the press. And it gets covered and reported on. And people learn about it. And the word and the idea spread all throughout the South, and the process is repeated elsewhere. In most cases, by people who are trained in nonviolence and understand when you are inevitably attacked by these angry mobs of white people, you don't fight back. Because that gives you the moral high ground. Nonviolence as a philosophy. To show people, remember, to raise awareness, to have pictures taken and stories written and, and video captured of what these people are willing to do to you, to simply keep you from sitting down at a damn lunch counter. And eventually it's not just lunch counters. You could have a, you could have a read-in at the segregated library. You could have a wade-in at the segregated public beach, a swim-in at the segregated public pool. You could engage in a sit-in type protest in a public park, public bathrooms, waiting rooms, anywhere, any public accommodation that's segregated, you could engage in this kind of nonviolent protest. And this begins to happen all throughout the South. And people organize in order to promote these kinds of protests. We've already looked at SCLC as an organization that would be committed to engaging in sit-ins and other types of nonviolent protests. <clears throat> but young people organize too, including in North Carolina. Those students end up joining forces with a, a really active student movement in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, why Nashville? Is there perhaps an institution there in Nashville that might support Young black activist, Fisk University that we've talked about in here more than once is in Nashville. One of the highly influential and venerable HBCUs, Fisk. Diane Nash and John Lewis are students at Fisk. John Lewis is a, a young man from Troy, Alabama in the black belt of Alabama from a rural area there outside of Troy, actually, from, grew up on a farm. Always had aspirations of becoming a preacher. He famously said he would uh, preach to the chickens on the farm, practicing his sermons, anyway, he wants to preach to. And he ends up at a uh, seminary there, Baptist Seminary in Nashville, and, and eventually at Fisk. Um, Diane Nash was a former beauty queen from Chicago who initially went to Howard but also ends up at Fisk where she meets John Lewis and others and they end up um, attending workshops and nonviolent protests under the leadership of a man named James Lawson where they would train and, and role play they would actually have people there in the workshops who would role play as the angry whites who would yell at them, spit on them, beat them. And you were trained to not fight back. And you were trained to organize, to, to be able to know that, okay, these people are going to be arrested. We want to have a second wave and a third wave to come in and sit in after those people are arrested. To have those kind of plans to deal with what you knew was going to come. And to the point of organization, these students who learned under Jim Lawson decided to have their own actual organization, structurally speaking, specifically independent of SCLC, these are young people, and yes, some of them, like Lewis, you know, had been a part of the church and aspirations of being ministers, but they wanted an organization that was not strictly run by a bunch of older preachers who had their own ideas about the way things should go. But under the tutelage then of an older woman named Ella Baker, 
who had been a part of SCLC, had been its secretary for a while, they formed SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in order to organize these kinds of nonviolent protests. The first of which, uh, the first SNCC campaign was there, of course, in Nashville, where they desegregated the lunch counters and other facilities in downtown Nashville. Famously, at one point, Diana Nash herself confronted the mayor of Nashville at the time on the steps of the courthouse with cameras rolling and asked him, basically, you know, as a man, you know, can you morally support a system of segregation that essentially holds black people down as second-class citizens? And remarkably, this older, white, mayor, a typical sort of southern mayor of a very segregated and racist town, has to step up and say, no, as a man, I only do one answer to that, and it was no. And so the mayor becomes an ally in desegregating facilities in downtown Nashville. Now, more broadly, you see this quotation from Nash here. She says, we presented southern white racists with a new set of options. <laughs> Kill us or desegregate and remain nonviolent in the process to maintain that moral upper hand. That's Ella Baker at top right, John Lewis in the middle, and there John Lewis receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama, who vividly eulogized him here in Atlanta when he died uh, just last year. Students top left, notably, as you can see, uh, including white students. SNCC was initially an interracial organization that, those students there were in Jackson, Mississippi, being humiliated by the angry white mob, which eventually would, in addition to pouring condiments and the like on them, just pull them off the bar stools and beat them. Anybody been to the Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta? I did you do the sit-in thing? No, we didn't get to do that. We, did, we went for high middle school, but we, they didn't let us sit on the counters. I didn't even know that was a thing. I saw really? The, yeah. I, saw the, I saw the counters, but I just didn't know that you could sit there and you could put on the headphones yeah. and it's like that. But hey, I didn't go inside. That's a shame. Did you get to do it? No, I didn't. I mean, you might choose not to, in fairness. It's kind of disturbing. Like, you put the headphones on and you've got the people screaming the obscenities and you might guess the kind of things that they would say. And you put your hands on the counter and you're sitting on the seat that vibrates like it's being kicked and that kind of thing. And it's supposed to be, it's got a little timer there like to see how long you would sit and take this kind of abuse. It's... It's kind of disturbing, and I guess it's probably meant to be that way, but um, just one of the many cool kind of interactive things that they have there in the museum in downtown. If you haven't been, you should definitely try to go. Uh, bottom right there, you see King, and at his right hand is Abernathy. That's John Lewis right there to his left. SNCC and SCLC often uh, coordinated together. So here we are, by now we are here in the 1960s, 60, 61. You'll recall from the previous lecture that the Supreme Court had handed down a decision in Morgan versus Virginia that had said, you know, by the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, the federal government could declare there should be no segregation in interstate travel, interstate bus travel. So like Greyhound trailways. But how do you test the reality of whether that, you know, would be true or, or actually would be recognized or upheld? John Lewis decided to do it with his roommate, who is pictured there in that wonderful photograph in the middle that encapsulates everything that sort of SNCC felt about Dr. King. <laughs> his name is Bernard Lafayette and you can see he's kind of looking at King with a, almost a, a suspicious look like definitely we revere you and we, we appreciate you but we're also kind of suspicious of you and your motives and we kind of want to do our own thing they used to call in SNCC they called King the Lord because he kind of maybe carried himself a little bit too much self-importance and um, they could sometimes be highly critical of him, though they did respect him, of course. But I mentioned Lafayette here because he and John Lewis, roommates at Fisk at one time, 
were the first two to get on a Greyhound bus and ride down into the South. And just see what happened. I can't, you cannot imagine the courage it took to do such a thing. Even after they had done that, and it was decided that, okay, well, Lafayette and Lewis are not dead. <laughs> they have returned to us alive. So why don't we organize a much larger group, an interracial group, and we'll go and not just ride the bus. We'll, when the Greyhound bus or the Trailways bus stops at the bus stations in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, wherever, all the way down to New Orleans. We'll start in Washington, D.C. We'll go all the way down to New Orleans. And we'll stop at the bus stations and test the facilities at the station. Whites only lunch counters, bathrooms, waiting rooms, and so on. We'll have our interracial group and we'll go in and try to get served in these different segregated places. Because their view of the Morgan decision was that those ought to be desegregated too. What's that? They went all out. All out. And it was such an undertaking that there were some of these ki kids, I mean, they're kids. Lafayette among them was not 21 and therefore had to have organizationally get a parent's approval to go on such a mission. This was organized, by the way, by a group called CORE. I think I mentioned CORE in here before, Congress of Racial Equality. Court required that if you weren't 21, you had a parent's signature, and Bernard Lafayette's father said, I'm not signing your death warrant. <laughs> and so even though he and Lewis had, had already done this, his father refused to sign, and he didn't get to be a part, initially, of the first so-called freedom ride. Amazingly, these people made it all the way through Georgia without being attacked or killed or arrested. And then the bus got outside of Anniston, Alabama, in northeast Alabama, where the Ku Klux Klan uh, ran the bus off the road, firebombed it with homemade, what they call Molotov cocktails, little glass bottle gas bombs. Of course, setting fire to the bus, forcing the people out of it who then got beaten by the local Klan. But they resolved, we're not going to quit, we're going to carry on. We'll have the bus company send a new bus and we'll go on to Birmingham, where the local police commissioner had colluded with the Klan to basically allow them a half hour to beat these people at the bus station before the police arrived. It is at this point that SNCC up in Nashville decides to send reinforcements because some of these people have been hospitalized by these beatings. And it so happens that Bernard Lafayette had turned 21 in the intervening weeks and decided to come and be a part of this along with John Lewis. And they carry on to south of the capital city of Montgomery where the same thing happens again at the bus station. Uh, the significant wrinkle this time being that in addition to the re reinforcements from SNCC, the group was now being followed by a personal advisor to President John F. Kennedy, who himself got beaten in the melee in Montgomery. So the report is delivered directly back to the president of what is happening, and Kennedy decides to get involved in this, telephoning the governor of Alabama and saying, what the hell is wrong with you? This is an embarrassment to America internationally. You know, if you haven't heard, there's a Cold War on, and the Soviet Union loves it when shit like this happens. You need to protect these people, and he refuses. It takes a ruling from a judge, this one of the same federal judges who had the bravery to issue the Browder v. Gale decision, to order the state of Alabama to use state troopers and National Guard to protect these riders as they carry on to Mississippi. That being said, before we give Kennedy too much credit, in his conversations with the governor of Mississippi, who's also a striving segregationist, he uh, essentially agreed to the understanding that Mississippi would protect the rioters, but it was going to take them directly to prison for inciting a riot and threatening a breakdown of law and order. So that Freedom Rider bus is just taken right on into jail in Jackson, and those individuals decide this is a Diane Nash thing, jail, no bail. Allow, go to jail. I mean, you're going to jail. Don't post bail. Allow yourself to sit in jail. Almost, they would call it a jail-in, like a sit-in in jail. 
refuse to be bailed out, serve out your sentence, and your very imprisonment will serve, serve as a form of protest. Because that's going to raise awareness that you're sitting down there locked up in the state penitentiary at Parchman Farm. Perhaps the most infamous penitentiary in all of the segregated South, which functioned essentially like an old plantation up there in the Mississippi Delta. Now, we call it the Freedom Rides plural because they did it again and again and again. Knowing they would go to jail in Mississippi, but allowing themselves to, as they would say, fill up the jails as a form of protest in and of itself. And this, of course, raises awareness. It's inspirational to other people. It boosts the profile of CORE and SNCC. But, of course, SCLC is active at the same time. Their mode of operation was to go to one city and for several weeks or months to focus on the issues at hand, segregation and disenfranchisement in that one city. In 1963, that city was Birmingham. The local SCLC preacher leader there in Birmingham was a man named Fred Shovelsworth, who you see pictured at top right with Abernathy and King. It was Shuttlesworth's idea to open a campaign there in Birmingham because SCLC had, had campaigns elsewhere. For the previous year, they had one in Albany, Georgia. And it wasn't super successful because the white sheriff there was smart enough to know that if he taught his deputies to sort of behave while they were on camera and to keep angry, stupid, racist white people in line while the press was there, they could sort of hide the realities of white supremacy in Albany while King and SCLC were in town. Fred Shuttlesworth knew that the local law enforcement leader in Birmingham, a man named Bull Connor, was not that smart. And that if they had a campaign in Birmingham, it would be much more successful, and oh, how right he was. The strategy was to boycott downtown businesses, white businesses that refused to hire black people and that segregated their waiting rooms, water fountains, bathrooms, whatever. To picket outside of those businesses, that is to have protest lines with signs saying, hey, don't do business here. And to march periodically throughout the city in support of these efforts. To have mass meetings at local churches like Shuttlesworth Church to where you would tell people this is what we're doing. You would have sermons, of course, spiritually in support of that. Cain would show up and Abernathy and so on. And then this might force the white business's hand because they would be losing money. So you appeal to people morally, but also you appeal to their pocketbook at the same time. Uh, meanwhile, though, Bull Connor does everything he can to thwart these efforts. Uh, he refuses to issue permits, for example, for the marching and the picketing, and he has these people arrested in mass, including King himself at one point, who famously, while he is in jail in Birmingham, writes these letters, specifically a letter to white clergymen, white preachers in Birmingham, who are like, hey, simmer down now. Slow down. Take it easy. You're pushing too hard. Bad things are going to happen. Just wait a while. And Cain writes this letter from Birmingham Jail, which he says, let me break it down for you why we can't wait any longer. Because we've been waiting a while. So many people were arrested, in fact, that at one point, a man named James Bevel, an influential uh, leader in the movement, decides that we could have a sort of children's campaign or crusade where we encourage local school kids to stay out of school one day and to march and we'll sort of dare Bull Connor to arrest a bunch of kids, which he did, and which as you can see he is vividly captured on camera. It is around that time that Connor orders the local police with their canine units to attack peaceful, nonviolent, unarmed protesters in a city park in downtown Birmingham. And he also, he was actually the public safety commissioner, he's in charge of the fire department too, and he orders them to use not just fire hoses, but high pressure water cannons to disperse these people, including literally rolling them down the sidewalk 
with water pressure enough to strip the skin off your back, dogs being allowed to bite unarmed protesters, all of it captured on camera. All of it broadcast throughout the country. Soviet Union loves it. They're like, ha ha, look at American democracy. What a lie. Huge embarrassment for the United States. And a lot of people throughout the country, too, are appalled at the lengths to which people would go. Eventually, there's a settlement. The white business people decide that this is horrible for Birmingham's image, detrimental to their pocketbook, as was, of course, the boycott. And so note here that it's not that they're morally convinced that segregation is wrong or that white supremacy is wrong. They decide we're losing money, so we'll, we'll, we'll agree to a settlement. And King and the white business leaders sit down and they decide, okay, please leave, please get out of town, Martin Luther King and SCLC, and we agree that we will take down the white and colored only signs and we'll agree to hire some black clerks and such. Fred Shuttlesworth was disappointed because he wanted a much larger agreement, including local leaders agreeing to desegregate Birmingham schools. To that point in Alabama, not one single black child had ever sat down in anything other than an all-black school in Alabama, 10 years after Brown. Shuttlesworth had been fighting that ever since. And so the fact that this settlement didn't include anything that addressed that was very disappointing to him. But that was it, and King leaves town, and Shuttlesworth is left to carry on the fight. 63 was an incredibly consequential year, though. Even beyond just those events, that was in the spring, by the way, all of that that happened in Birmingham. Later that year, George Wallace orchestrated the absurd charade that would come to be known as the stand in the schoolhouse door. Two young black students in Alabama were challenging the total segregation of the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, just west of Birmingham. And a federal court had ordered their admission to the university, so it was going to be desegregated. Understand that this is the institution of white supremacy in the state where all the state's lawyers were trained who became great politicians, including the governor then of Alabama, George Wallace, who had been defeated in a run for governor several years prior by a guy who decided to basically run on segregation and nothing else. And Wallace infamously vowed that he would never allow that to be the case again. He would never get out inwarded again. And so he runs as the ultimate segregationist candidate and wins and vows in his inaugural address that he will maintain segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Of course, he failed miserably in that, but this was what he, he made his name on. And so he decides he's going to make a big show of defying the court's order, allowing these two students in at the University of Alabama. And I say a show, it, it, it had no meaning legally whatsoever. He has positioned himself in that photograph. He, he, they got the shortest state troopers possible because he's really short and they didn't want him to look small. And he positions them on either side of him. And he confronts uh, an official from the Department of Justice who was escorting these students, who, by the way, had already been enrolled. He wasn't stopping anything from happening. They were just trying to go and register for classes. And he makes a big show of blocking the door to the building. And if, there's another great photo that shows you the mass of press and cameras that are assembled. And that was the whole point for Wallace. To make a big show of defiance, even though it would mean legally nothing. Those students would be registered eventually. They would attend classes. But it riles people up. It, a bunch of angry white segregationists loved it. They loved Wallace for it. I mean, we have seen the value of a demagogue riling up angry white people by engaging in pointless forms of defiance vividly over the last four years. After that incident, President Kennedy decides, to his credit, to give a speech on national television in which he says civil rights is an issue in America 
as old as the scriptures and as clear as the Constitution. That's not nothing for the American president to step up and relate the struggle for civil rights to the Christian Old Testament and to say it's endemic in the Constitution. That's a big deal. And what he was doing is proposing a bill, a civil rights bill, which would, among other things, outlaw segregation in public accommodations. The very evening that he makes that moral appeal, not the kind of appeal like you're going to lose money or it embarrasses America in the Cold War, but that very moral appeal, that very evening, the leader of the NAACP in Mississippi, Medgar Evers, is murdered in his driveway, shot dead in front of his wife. And then that summer, later that summer, schools in places like Birmingham, where Shuttlesworth had filed a court case, were finally set to be desegregated in some of the most segregated parts of the Deep South for the very first time. There is a mass protest of hundreds of thousands of people, the kind of which A. Philip Randolph had envisioned years before a march on Washington. And then finally, there is violence of the absolute worst kind in Birmingham in reaction to the potential desegregation of schools. We'll have to pick it up here. You'll remind me that we stopped with the murder of Medgar Evers on the evening of Kennedy delivering that speech, and we'll pick back up there after, I guess, the midterm. Well, this will have to carry over. We'll have to adjust our schedule. And you'll have to remind me to um, cut off, I guess, the um, study guide in the midterm right at this and to not include anything that follows this, okay? Does that make sense? Like, I can't rightly ask you about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act if we never got there. Can't ask you about Bloody Sunday if we never got there. So, we'll stop at Murder of Edgar Evers. That'll be the end of the information that you'll need for the midterm. And then when we come back in the term, that's just where we'll pick up. We'll have, we'll finish this lecture. We'll have another one on black power. Maybe even one more on the, the long backlash, as I call it. And, um, well, not as I call it, but as it has been called. Um, I can't take credit <laughs> for that. Uh, and, and then that'll be the sort of end of our history portion, and we'll move forward with the other core content areas, including two guest lectures in areas where I would be like over my head, but we have uh, other professors here who can speak more authoritatively to say, for example, black psychology or uh, the African-American humanities. So uh, that's our roadmap moving forward. Any questions? Um, the midterm is gonna be online or? Yeah, all online. Yeah, it'd be the same as the quizzes, just um, a little bit longer. Um, I, I, if you look at that study guide, I, said I'm not going to ask you about the additional readings because I don't want you to have to go back and read all that. Uh, that includes, by the way, if you look at this schedule, you were scheduled to read um, James Baldwin and Malcolm X's Ballad of the Bullet. We're pushing that, pushing that to coincide with the finishing this lecture and the Black Power lecture. So and that'll be after the midterm. midterm. What's that? That's not gonna be that will not be on the midterm, correct. Nor will any of the other additional readings like Ida Wells' Red Record and, and Du Bois' oh, okay. Souls of Black Folks, not on there. So Strictly do... from the lectures. Okay. Okay. All the questions will come 100% from lectures. So what you would do is uh, have the PowerPoints handy, the list of terms in the study guide, and of course the lecture videos and your notes that you already have. Okay. And of course the textbook, which we haven't been following. Mean, I've expounded way beyond the textbook and our history lectures. But if you go back to those first two, uh, foundations of and development of the discipline, that's directly from the textbook. So it would help you there. Okay. And uh, so Wednesday, are you going to keep doing this, or are we just going to review for the midterm? Like we just review? Hey, I'll come in, honestly, if y'all want to show up and you've got questions about midterm, I will answer any questions you have. Uh, that'll basically be just a review Q&A day, and uh, that's the day the exam will open, mm -hmm. and it'll stay open for a week. And so we'll just resume on uh, Monday. Okay. Wait, Monday? Isn't Monday's Tuesday? Correct. I'm sorry. 
will resume a week after Monday. Yeah, yeah. That, that is true. Yeah. So you may want to, when, when it opens up on Wednesday, if you want to enjoy your spring break, you may want to knock it out at some point before that Monday. Uh, but it'll, I'll kind of leave it open so it'll be up to you. And then, yes, when we come back from the break, that's when we'll pick up. And literally, I mean, right here where we left off and have, you know, probably two, maybe three lectures more on history and then finish up with the other core content areas. Because classes end in April. Say again? Classes end in April. Yeah, at the end of the month. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Normally we're like a week into May, but we're, for whatever reason, we're like a few days early this year. So, yeah. I think um, the exam period runs into the first few days of May, but yeah, I think classes are over by the end of April. Yeah. All right.